many of our people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. Light was given that helped us to understand the scriptures in regard to Christ, His mission, and His priesthood. A line of truth extending from 1844 to the time when we shall enter the city of God was made plain. I want to start off by telling you a little bit about my wife. I, uh, I love my wife very, very much. love my wife very, very dearly. There's something that when she's uh, driving, um, let's put it this way, we're different drivers. <laughs> we're different drivers. I don't know if you drive the same way as your wife or your husband. Or, but anyways, I'll, I'll let you know, when, when, uh, when she's driving, she's focused on the road. Now, I, I will say this as a caveat, uh, that she has fewer accidents than I do, and she has fewer tickets than I do. So, uh, by all standards, she's a better driver than I am. But when she's driving, she's focused on the road, very focused on the road. Now, me, I have a different philosophy when I'm driving. I, I, I'm focused on the road, but I'm focused on the externals as well. So if you asked her, uh, you know, you're giving her directions and you say, oh yeah, it's over there by the, uh, the Maccas or the, the Kmart, uh, she would be like, I don't know where that's at. Where is that? I haven't seen it. I'm like, yeah, we've driven by it, uh, you know, 20, 30 times. And uh, that's just how I am. Like when I'm driving, I'm looking around at my surroundings. I'm scanning, you know, I'm scanning the road. I'm scanning the, the peripherals. She's got more of a, a, a targeted, narrow uh, uh, vision, so to speak. And, you know, she's focused on the road. Let me give you another illustration. Um, when I am, I like, to, uh, I like to go cycling. Do we have any other cyclists in here? Nice, nice. You, like, you guys like cycling. Perfect. Excellent. Um, I love to ride my bike. I love to go cycling. And... I started off by riding a mountain bike and going off on the trails and stuff. And I found out that you gotta, many times to get to the trail, you gotta drive, and then you gotta get, you gotta get all ready, and then you gotta drive to the trail, then you gotta, you know, ride on the trail, and then you gotta drive back, and then put everything away, and it's just like adds all this extra time. So I started uh, riding a road bike. Uh, now a road bike is, is, riding on the road is probably a little bit more dangerous. Than, than riding on a trail. And the thing about riding on a, a road bike is you have these very, very narrow tires. The steering is very sensitive. And sometimes you get going pretty fast. The fastest I've gone was about 47 miles per hour, which is, I don't know how many in kilometers, about 70, 80, something like that, kilometers per hour. Now you get going that fast, I mean, you have to have laser-like focus because I mean, you hit a bump or you get a little wobbly, uh, you can get uh, injured very, very seriously. But not only uh, do you have to focus on what's on the road, not to run over any bumps or uh, run over any nails, you have to be very careful about hitting rocks, but when you're on the road, you also have to be aware of cars, right? traffic. So you have to watch where your tire is going but then you got to be paying attention to what's around. Now, I give these two illustrations uh, because of a certain verse in the Bible. There's a certain verse in the Bible, and when speaking about uh, who God is, and speaking of the, uh, the Trinity, so to speak, many people will go to and hone in and focus on a single verse found in 1 John. You probably know which one I'm talking about. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. And many people will hone in and just focus so much and have a, a tunnel vision, so to speak, on that one verse that they actually, many people, lose sight of the periphery of what's going on around that verse. And just like me, as I'm riding my bike down the road, if I'm so focused on just right what, this, this one, what's right in front of me, uh, I can lose sight of what's going on around, and that could be very dangerous. 
I would say that in the Word of God, if you focus on this one verse and not look at the context, that is also very dangerous. And you can actually maybe misinterpret it. So we need to understand the context. So what I want to do today is look at 1 John chapter 5, and not so much the uh, verse 7, but I want to look at what's around it and look at the context today. And it's very, very fascinating. It was a very uh, interesting study. As I opened up my word, compared scripture with scripture, I found some uh, interesting things that I'd like to share with you this morning. But first of all, let me look at the, uh, the verse in context. Verse 7. For there are three that bear record. Now, the, the verse in question is actually part of verse 7 and part of verse 8. And scholars throughout history, even today, there is uh, debate about whether oh, this verse should be in the Bible or not. I'm not going to tell you what to believe, but you need to come uh, on that. Now, many people will say, well, there's all this external evidence that it didn't come until later. But then an individual will say, well, it's God's word, and uh, he must have allowed it in there. Um, I'll let you make your own decision about that. But the question, the verse in question is, uh, in heaven, right there, it says, there are three that bear record. The, the, the phrase in question is right here, in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth. So from that phrase, in heaven to in earth, is the one, and maybe you have uh, a version that actually puts brackets around it. Maybe you have a version that is, is actually not even in your version. There's some versions that don't even clu- include that section right there, because it's a, a very controversial one. Nevertheless, many people will hone in on this verse and, and kind of exclude everything else in the context and say, well, look right there, you have a trinity. You have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There you have it. Unequivocally, you have a trinity. These three, there's three in, the, in one. And it's clear, right? This is what people say uh, without reading the context. Now, let's just think about that for a second, because many of those that believe in a trinity or in a three co-eternal persons, they will say that if they are three... And they were co-equal, they're co-eternal, so to speak, um, co-eternal, then you truly can't have a father and son relationship. Are you with me? If, uh, if I am the same age as another person, I can't be their father. And they can't be my son because they're the same age. They're twins, exactly, uh, uh, so to speak. And so this is what we find in the word uh, this is what we find, uh, I'm sorry, this is what we find people are trying to say that the Word is telling us. So, if you have three co-eternal persons, you cannot have a father and a son. Now, what I want to show you is the context is actually all about accepting the Son of God in 1 John chapter 5. So, let's start with verse 1. Now, I'll leave with you if you want to uh, include that section of 1 John 5 in your Bible or if you would... Do not want to. Okay, so verse 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is, is what? Born of God. Is born of God. And everyone that loveth him begat, uh, him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. What is this saying? It says, hey, if you are born of God, or if you are begotten of God, and you love God, you're going to love everyone that is also born of God. If you're born of God, you're going to love the others that are also born of God. And so, what does this tell us? Hey, we ought to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to love, and and not only that, Jesus says to love our enemies. But if we're born of God, then it makes sense that we would also love our, those others that are born of God. Yes. Whoever loves God would also love Jesus. Correct. Yes, correct. Uh, he that loveth him that begat, which is the Father, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Right, which, is, which would include Jesus Christ. The context right there, if you look at verse 2, it says, By this we know that we love the children of God. 
And so this, this, uh, I think it can go either way. Um, but primarily I would say that this is talking about uh, loving our brothers and sisters. It says when we love God and keep his commandments. And that's part of his commandments, right? Mm -hmm. Is the first four I identify and deal with uh, our relationship with God. The last six deal with our relationship with fellow human beings. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Now you hear many preachers today, many Christians are saying, oh, it is slavery, it's a yoke, it's bondage to keep the commandments. You believe in keeping the commandments? You're a slave. Have you ever heard that before? He said to you last week. He says, you know, you hear that so often today. You're in bondage if you keep the commandments. It's bondage. But what does the Bible say? What does John say? Now, John was one of Jesus' closest disciples. And John says, hey, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. So he says, you know, if you love God, you will do what? You will keep his commandments. I, I think I recall Jesus saying something similar. Mm -hmm. If you love me, keep my commandments. And, and what does it say? That his commandments are not Grievous. Now, how do we know if we are truly born of God? According to the context here, according to John. If we're born of God, we will, we will believe that Jesus Christ, right? Jesus is the Christ, but also that we will keep his commandments. If we're born of God, we will keep his commandments. But not only that, because there's a lot of people that are not born of God that keep his commandments, so to speak, on the outside. In fact, there was a whole nation of them that kept God's commandments, but they were not born of God. How do we know that? They crucified the Son of God. And so how do we know that we are truly born of God? It says when His commandments are not grievous. Grievous. What, is it? what does grievous mean? No longer enmity. So you don't have a hatred for the law. Right? What, what, how else would you describe yes. grievous? Against. Yes. yes, you're not against them. Grievous. What, what else? What's another? A burden. A burden. There you go. Burdensome. Burdensome. I like that. Burdensome. You know, it's, it's when you, uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced it when you try to do the right thing, but your heart's not in it. Have you ever, have you ever been in that situation? It's like, I know I shouldn't be doing this anymore. Oh, but I just want to so bad, so badly. <laughs> Take it from the top again. We were looking at verse, <laughs> we were looking at verse 3, right? This is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Now, there must be people that are watching that Satan doesn't want them to hear or see this message. Because this is, a, a, truly, this is a powerful study that was really blessed to me. And many people are confused about 1 John chapter 5. But, right here, verse 3, His commandments are not grievous. Grievous. They're not burdensome. Really? Because many Christians today are saying that they're burdensome. But John said that they're not burdensome. So which one are they? Which, who do you believe? Do you believe Christians today? Do you believe pastors and preachers? Do you believe other men today? Or do you believe the Word of God? Word. You believe the Word of God. And John, under the inspiration of the Spirit, says that the commandments are not grievous. Are the commandments grievous to you? If they are, if they are, and trust me, I've been in that situation where you want to do the right thing, you know you're convicted what the right thing is, but you find it hard to do the right thing. Well, how do we find it to the commandments and what God is commanding us to do, how do we make that a, a delight? How do we make that a delight? Well, we can't make it a delight, but we know somebody who can. We know somebody that can change our heart. We know somebody that uh, we can get connected with that will work on our hearts and on our minds so that the commandments and doing the right thing and doing the commandments of God will not be grievous, but will be a, a delight, a joy, a pleasure. Th you know, this is what God's design is for us, mm. is that we can do the right thing mm. and we'll find pleasure in it. 
that our hearts will actually desire to do the right thing. And um, so that's how we know we're born of God. Now, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. So I haven't even gotten in the lesson yet. Um, so what is the first thing here we see? Uh, born of God. You see it in verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Born of God. Verse 4. Whosoever is born of God. Whoever is born of God. Now, if we're born of God, what, according to verse 4, will take place? Overcome the world. Overcome the world. Mm -hmm. If we're born of God, overcome the world. Mm -hmm. Overcome the world. So will we desire the, the, the world anymore? Will we desire? No. If we're born of God, we will overcome the world. Well, how? It says this is the victory, verse 4, and this is the victory that overcomes the world. Oh, well, that's very nice of you, John, to explain it very plainly. That if we're born of God, we will overcome the world. And this is how, the end of the verse, our faith. Even our faith or our belief. So are you with me so far? So if you're born of God, you're going to overcome the world through your belief or faith in what? <laughs> in what? In what? Verse 5. Who is he? That overcometh the world. Okay, so if we're born of God, overcome the world, who is that? The one that has faith? Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that? Jesus, Jesus is the Son of, God. Son of God. Hmm. Verse 1 through 5, I would summarize it as this. John is telling us who or, uh, I should say what or who to believe in. Mm -hmm. Who or what to believe in? Son of God. Right, the Son of God. But there's actually two parts of that. So if we're born of God, we'll overcome the world through faith that, verse 1, Jesus, Christ, Jesus is the Christ. That's verse 1. Yeah. That this man, Jesus of Nazareth, that he is the Christ mm -hmm. that was foretold, which is, verse 5, the Son of God. He uses them interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Christ, Son of God. Christ, Son of God. They're interchangeable. In fact, in the Old Testament, it's very clear. If you, if you compare the Old Testament with the New Testament, they all understood this. They all understood that the Christ would be God's Son, the Son of God. And so this is why there's really, in verse 1, we believe that Jesus, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, is the Christ, the Son of God. Now that sets the foundation because this is what John is trying to reveal to the world and to show us. He's trying to show us and convince us that this man Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's the context of 1 John chapter 5. This is the foundation of 1 John chapter 5. Now remember, if you have a co-eternal person named Jesus Christ, he can't be a son. And so, let me just throw the... Leave that right there. Okay. Let's continue on. Now, verse 6 through 11. Verse 6 through 11. I would summarize as this. It's the proof. It's the proof. Verse 1 through 5 shows us, John is saying what we should believe in, who we should believe in. Verse 6 through 10 or 11, that's the proof. Let me show you, actually, verse, let's start with verse 6. Uh, if you look down, and we're just going to skim through it. Now, in these verses, 6 through 11, the word witness is found five times. Five times. Actually, well, six. It's actually six if you, if you look at that one section that people always quote. Um, yeah. And bear record, or record, is actually found three times. So, verse 6, you have witness. Verse 7, record. And then uh, in there is bear witness as well. And... Uh, and then verse 7, these agree. Verse 9 says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For the witness of God hath testified of his Son. Verse 10, He believes in the Son of God hath the witness. Towards the end of the verse, the record. Verse 11, the record. And so over and over again, you have witness, 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 record, record, record. I feel like a broken record. <laughs> but if you have a witness... 
or somebody witnessing or testifying or somebody that is bearing record, what are they doing? They're presenting evidence, evidence proof, mm. proof. And so the fact that in verse 6 through 11, John, uh, John is saying, we will witness, 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 record, record, record. He's trying to prove something. Does that make sense? He's trying to prove something. Well, what is he trying to prove? Well, he already told us that this man, Jesus, is the Christ, the Son of God. So we're going to look at this proof. What is John's proof? What is John's proof? Now, let's look at verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Okay, so there is some evidence right here that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. What, was, what is the evidence? He says, the water and the blood. It says, and, and the Spirit also beareth witness. Bears witness to what? Bears witness to the water and the blood. Now, if you read, now let's, let's just, we'll just for right now, We'll just skip over that one section because we want to look at the context. We're not looking in at this certain verse. This, this, so we're not focusing. We're looking at the surroundings. And so let's do that. I'm going to actually read it as if it's not there. I'll start in verse 6 again. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record. The Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. These three agree in one. Verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. And this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. So we have the proof. Of, of why we should believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And what is the proof? The water and the blood. The water and the blood. Now, what is this speaking about? Because there's, people have a lot of ideas on this. Now, I, uh, I thought, and there could certainly be an application to the water being the baptism of Jesus Christ. The blood is talking about the cross. And so, you know, you have the baptism and the, uh, the, the blood. And I, I certainly, there, there does seem to be an application there. But I want to show you something that, to me, actually makes uh, even more sense uh, in the context. So turn with me to John chapter 19, and we're going to look at the water and the blood and the Spirit bearing witness, because this is what is given as evidence. This is the proof that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John 19 and verse, uh, verse, start in verse 30, 30, actually, there we go, 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So Jesus, he does what? He died, right? Jesus died. Verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So what happens? He says uh, that Jesus dies, and the Jews, they, wanted, uh, they didn't want to disrespect the Sabbath by having soldiers uh, being crucified. And so they would take them down and break their legs so they couldn't run away. Verse 32, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first, and... Uh, the other which was crucified with him. So they broke the, the two legs, right? The legs of one guy on Jesus' side and the legs of the other thief on the other side. Verse 33, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they did what? They didn't break his legs. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Jesus dies. They don't want them on the, on the cross on Sabbath. They take him down, break their legs. They come to Jesus. They see he's dead. They didn't break his legs. Now what did they do? Verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Pierced his side. Why? Why? Because he was dead, and instead of breaking of his legs, he pierces his side. Now that's important. And forthwith, that means immediately, came there out 
Blood and water. Water and blood. Now remember, 1 John 5, he's saying that uh, the water and the blood is the proof that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. <laughs> Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. Okay, now why is this important? The blood and water testifies that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, now I just want to just reiterate and, and repeat just for a, a second. They broke, they didn't, they came to Jesus. Instead of breaking his legs, they pierced him and water and blood came out. Water and blood came out. Verse 36. Verse 36. <clears throat> Are you with me? For these things were done. Okay? They were what? Done. 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 Or happened. No. These things happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. Very interesting. So, John, the writer of the, the, the Gospel of John, is saying, hey, look, he's, he's recalling this, he's writing this down. As he's writing this Gospel, he, he's probably looking back, he's thinking, okay, of this incident where Jesus dies, the soldiers come, break the legs of the other two, they didn't break Jesus' legs, instead they pierced him, water and blood came out, and he says, hmm, this happened, that whole thing happened, so that the scriptures could be fulfilled. Well, what scriptures? Continue on. A bone of him shall not be broken. Are you with me? A bone of him shall not be broken. A bone of him shall not be broken. Turn to me to Exodus. Keep your fingers there. Exodus chapter 12. Why is that important that they did not break his legs? Because... It's prophesied that his legs or should not have any bones that would be broken. Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. Now you uh, understand the context here. Uh, these, the plagues are being poured out, and they are about to flee Egypt. But before they do, uh, there is an institution that is uh, put in place, which is the Passover. So, verse 46. Okay, so we're looking at verse 46. Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. In one house is shall it be eaten. Now, this is talking about the Passover lamb. Uh, in one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall you break a bone thereof. So, the instructions are given that when you celebrate the Passover and you slay the Passover lamb, make sure that you do not break a bone. Why? Because it actually, not breaking the bone, points forward to when Jesus is on the cross and the soldiers come and they see that Jesus is dead already so they did not break his bones. So, you know, you see the co co connection there. Mm -hmm. right? John, looking back, writing his gospel, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes that connection. They're like, he sees what happened. It's like, oh, they didn't break his bones. That is because he's the Passover. And you could not break the Passover lamb's bones. It's like, whoa, Jesus is the Passover lamb. Do you see that? And so this is why the account is given in Scripture. This is why John, the same writer as 1 John, writes down this account of them not breaking his bones. Okay, now turn it back with me to John chapter 19. There's a couple other passages you could go to. Numbers 9, 12, Psalms 34, verse 20. Basically saying the same thing, that they do not break the bones of the Passover lamb. So it's very clear uh, that the, uh, the broken bone actually proves that Jesus Christ, or Jesus of Nazareth, is the Christ, because that lamb, the Passover lamb, pointed to the Christ. And so, the breaking of the bones proves, in John's mind, that Jesus is the Christ. 
verse 37. And again, another scripture says, they, have, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. Now, why did they pierce him? Because he was dead already. They came, he was dead already. They didn't break his bones. Instead, they pierced him. Water and blood came out. The breaking of the bones proves that Jesus is the Christ. What is the next one? Verse 37, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Where's that from? Zechariah. Turn with me to Zechariah. Chapter 12. Now this is very interesting. Zechariah chapter 12. And verse 10. It says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they pierced. Does that sound familiar? They shall look upon me whom they pierced. This is where he gets it from, actually. This is where he gets the, the idea that when they pierced him, this fulfilled this scripture. This scripture right here. Now watch this. Okay, verse 10. Let's read the rest of it. And they shall look upon me whom they pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. <laughs> by water and by blood. What is the water and the blood proof? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Why is he the Christ? Because they didn't break his bones. Why is he the Son of God? Because you're going to mourn for him that was pierced. You're going to mourn for him as one who is like a son, a firstborn. And so when John, uh, hmm, now, you remember, okay, let's, I don't know where I want to go next. Water, John, John says in verse 5, 1 John chapter 5, the water and the blood. And that's proof. That's proof. But he adds one more other, one other thing, right? The Spirit. The Spirit. Keep your finger in John 19, because we're going to come right back. But I want to read this. 1 John 5, 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Okay. Are you with me? You ready for this? All right. John 19.35. Oh, man. And he, verse 35, and he that saw it did what? Bear record. Very interesting use of terms right there. He says, he that saw it. Bear record, and his record is true, that you might know that he saith true, that you might believe. <laughs> Who's the he? Who's John speaking about? I find it interesting that he's speaking actually about huh? the, father. the Father, okay. He said Christ. Uh, verse 35, when he says, He that saw it bear record. He's talking about himself, actually. He's talking about himself. He that saw it bear record. And his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that you might believe. John is talking about himself. Was John there? Mm -hmm. Was John there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, now follow along with me. John, when he writes the Gospels, he comes to the crucifixion of Christ. And what does he say? I, I can imagine as he's writing about the crucifixion of Christ, he remembers that... The Okay. You follow along with me. Okay, so remember it's the spirit that bears witness, right? The spirit that bears witness. John, as he is writing under the inspiration of the Spirit, and he's writing the gospel under the inspiration of the Spirit, he pens down this whole thing. This whole thing that had happened, yeah. that the soldiers come, they don't break his legs, instead they pierce him, and water and blood flows out. The water and the blood 
simply is a result because they pierced him. They pierced him because he wasn't dead and they didn't break his legs. So the water and the blood proves those and shows those two, two things. He's the son of God and he is the Christ. But John, not only was he there, he watched it with his own eyes. And later on, as he's recalling it and writing it down in the gospel, he says, he, speaking of himself in the third person, bear record. So John, in 1 John chapter 5, it wasn't the first time, I don't believe, that John wrote it down. He must have told them already. He must have borne record or the Spirit spoke to him and and connected the verses in the Old Testament with what happened. So in 1 John chapter 5, you come and it says the water and the blood and the Spirit beareth witness. How was the Spirit bearing witness? In John. (laughs) In John. Right? Isn't that what uh, in in Peter it says that uh, the Spirit uh, is the one that wrote the Scriptures or, or inspired the men's mind to write the Scriptures? Well, as John is writing the Gospel, the Spirit is bearing witness through John. Through John and his experience. So now turn with me to... Does that make sense? Yes. 1 John chapter 5. Now, some people might, might agree, might disagree with me. Uh, I don't know. I think, it, to me, it makes a whole lot of sense. So, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. He tells us what to believe in or who to believe in. He tells us to believe that Jesus, this man of Nazareth, is the Christ, the Son of God. Verse 6 through 11 says, this is the proof, the water, the blood, the Spirit. These three agree in one. Agree in one what? Agree in one what? (laughs) Well, we read right there in John 19 that they're all testifying of the experience of Jesus on, on the cross that he is the Son of God. He is the Christ. This is what they're agreeing. This is what they're testifying. This is what they show us. Uh, clearly in the context of John 19. Now verse 9, 1 John 5, 9, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. So, hey, he's saying like, if we're going to believe men, we should believe God that he orchestrated such a thing, such a circumstances, And he knew about these circumstances well in advance that he was able to reveal to the prophets and through types and symbols that the Messiah, his legs would not be broken and the Messiah, he would be pierced. And then come along and he's able to orchestrate things in such a way that that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so this is the witness of God, the fulfillment of Scripture. The fulfillment of uh, these types and, and fulfillment of Scripture. Verse, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Now, who's the, who's the witness? The witness? Remember verse 6. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness. You see, the same witness that was in John as he saw, as he bare record of what happened to Jesus Christ, proving that he is the Christ, proving that he is the Son of God, that same witness that was in John that caused him to bear record, that same witness can be in us. And when that witness is in in us, we will also bear record that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Verse 11, And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. And so the first five verses, I would say, tells us what to believe in. The verse 6 through 11, that's the proof. Here is the the appeal, verse 12. He's just saying, look, this is proof that He's the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And you should receive him, because when we receive him, we receive life. Verse 12, he that hath the Son hath life. And he that has not the Son of God does not have life. So this is a matter of life and death. 
Are those my words or is that those John's words? Those are his words. This is a matter of life and death. You have the Son, you have life. Now, would we have life if we have somebody that is not really a son, but pretending to be a son? I don't know. That's up to, uh, it's not my decision. I'm glad I'm not the judge of that. You know, there's many people that don't understand who Jesus Christ is. Don't understand the relationship of the Father and the Son. And that God truly gave His literal only begotten Son. You know, they're still going to be in heaven. I believe that. There's many people that don't understand that, that believe in heaven. But for right now, here, God wants us to know this. That he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Here's the appeal. Verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Turn with me to John. He almost says the exact same thing in John chapter 20. John chapter 20, same writer, verse 31. John 20, 31. We'll, We'll start at verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31, but these are written. They're what? They're written. They're written. So in his gospel, he says, these things are written. In 1 John chapter 5, he's saying, I wrote these things. Why? That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And having believing, you might have life through his name. Do you see that in 1 John chapter 5, he's basically repeating what he's already said, Mm -hmm. that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Mm -hmm. and that believing in him, believing in his name, you have eternal life. Do you see this is what he said? He said the same thing all along. Mm -hmm. And uh, all right, so this is what we find in verse 13. To me have eternal life. Now, I don't think that's it, because he gives us a warning. He gives us a warning. Verse 16. If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death. Wait, hold on a second. A sin which is not unto death? What does that mean? Let's continue reading on. He shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. All right, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. What is that? You know, I've read this before, and it seemed very confusing. You know, it seems like there's, there's, a, there's a sin that's not unto death. There's a sin unto death. There's a sin not unto death. There's a sin unto death. Like, what, is that, what does that mean? There's a, there's a sin unto death. Well, that's got to be the unpardonable sin, isn't it? I mean, there's a sin unto death. That's the unpardonable sin, the one that you can't really... But what does the context say? What does the context say? Verse 12, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God does not have life. There's a sin unto death. The sin unto death is to reject life, which is to reject the Son of God. The sin unto death is to reject the Son of God, reject life, because it's in His Son that we have life, because He is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. The Son of God. Verse 20. And we know that the Son of God is come. I like how he writes that. Like, we know. We have no doubt. We're sure. right? Kind of like when Peter stood up in John chapter 6, verse 63, and he says, you know, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. He says, and we know and are sure that thou art the Son of God. (laughs) He says right here, he repeats that. And he says, we, we know that the Son of God has come. It's obvious. Like, we know that He's the Son of God. I just proved it. I just proved it to you by the water and the blood. And the Spirit bore with it. We know that the Son of God has come and hath, He's given us understanding. Now, what's interesting, some versions will say He has given us a mind. A mind. Well, whose mind would that be? The mind of Christ. Amen. His Spirit. And that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus. Okay, so who is that? Who is Him that is true? Him that is true? Well, Him that is true obviously has a Son. So Him that is true is a, is a Father. 
Sounds very similar to John 17, 3. This is, he, he heard John's prayer. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We'll look at verse, uh, the rest of that verse. Him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And eternal life. Him that is true. Him that is true. This is the true God, which is the Father. And eternal life is His Son, the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus. Isn't that what it says in verse 12? He that hath a Son has life. Well, what type of life? Eternal life. So to us, Jesus Christ is eternal life. Eternal life is in the Son of God. Verse 21. It's also an interesting verse. I've always wondered, like, okay, this is... John, why, why do you end your book like this? I mean, couldn't you have said something a little bit nicer, like, I hope to see you again. You know, I'm, I'm praying for you. Instead, he ends uh, it like this. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Huh, very interesting. The Holy Spirit must have spoken to him to say that because idols must have been a problem. Or maybe the Spirit wrote that down for us because just a few verses later, people will try to take a verse out of context to build up a false idol. And so he ends his book with, keep yourself from idol. What's an idol? Something that replaces God. Something that replaces God. Well, actually, in the Christian Jewish Bible, it actually says to guard yourself against false gods. False gods. That's what it is. It's a false god. An idol is a false god. Yeah. So he says, keep your children, keep your little children, keep yourselves from false gods. A false god. Yeah. I think it's very interesting. In the context of First John chapter five, he he shows us clearly yeah. that you need to believe. You want eternal life? Mm-hmm. Believe that this man, Jesus, is the Christ, the Son of God. Here's the proof. Here's the proof. The water, the blood, and the Spirit. And I'm making an appeal to you. Accept the Son. Accept the Son of God. Don't reject Him because you won't have life. And He ends it with, do not accept any other God, any other false God, other than the Father and the Son. Which comes to the commandments of knowing that we will not have any idols. Have right. And this Correct. Is the commandments. Keep the commandments. Oh, exactly. Oh, exactly. Oh, now, I just want to go back to verse 7. Let me read it. Uh, now, I read it right through. And uh, without uh, the, the, the section in there that people always point to, to say, oh, well, the Father's not really a Father, the Son is not really a Son, but God is really a Trinity. Uh, read the context. The context does not reveal that. The context reveals that John is trying to prove Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Um, First of all, that verse does not prove a trinity. If we read the context, it actually shows us otherwise. Um, That's all I will say on that, except for... As I was studying this, and I wanted to know what does John 5, 1 John 5, actually say? What is the, the surrounding, uh, what are the surroundings, surrounding verses? What is the context? As I was studying it, this, this uh, verse right here, it's, just, it's, it's always been kind of confusing, and many people will, will confuse it. And as I was studying, I heard a voice. Now you're gonna. Some people are probably gonna call me a heretic. Bum, bum. People are gonna say that I committed blasphemy. That I'm I'm taking away from the word of God. You can say what you want to, but I heard a voice, not an audible voice, but a thought to me. Cross, cross it out, cross it out. And I didn't. I, I just crossed a line through it so that I could read it either way, so that I could still read it. Uh, with that in there, but then I could kind of also skip over and read it how if it wasn't in there. And once I crossed it out and I could read it straight through, 
It made perfect sense. So it meant what the I water, mean, you know, the blood. Mm-hmm. The section from where it says in heaven to in earth, this is commonly known as the, the Yohanin comma, right? Yeah. It didn't show up until manuscripts. Uh, the earliest known manuscript, I believe, is in the 10th century, uh, but really did not show up in the text itself until I think it was the, the 14th or the 16th century. I'm not sure exactly the history, but uh, so, uh, so there's, there's, there's a lot of debate about that verse specifically. Yes. And that's not my intention, uh, is to study that, that specific verse, but the context around that yes. verse today. Yes. And to me, the context that we studied reveals that, to me, I need to cross it out. But, so, that, yes, oh, go ahead. Yes. It doesn't have that part. Right, right. Many modern, uh, modern, newer translations will actually omit that section. So is that 7 and 8? Uh, it's part of verse 7 and part of verse 8, yes. Oh, let, me just, let me just read it. Yeah. Let me read it as if it is crossed out. Um, verse 6, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water and blood, but by water. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. You, you, had, a, you, you well, had a question? I'm just, I'm just saying, so you're saying it wasn't there for a long time, but not not all of 7 and 8, half of 8 was there. Is that right? Or all of 7 and 8 won't be let me, yeah, let me read it, uh, verse, verse 7. Start with verse 7. For there are, are you, are you there? For there are three that bear record. Now, you would actually skip down yeah. the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Uh, that's how it. That's how it would read, uh, in the early manuscripts. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, but in the Greek language. Uh, okay. So yeah. there are three that bear record: the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three are one. Well, later on in history, uh, it's some of the manuscripts. And there's a debate about it. You know, that's fine. I'm not here to de- debate and say somebody. If somebody says it belongs in there. I'm not going to fight with them about that. All I'm telling you is what I, as I studied it, the context. If you read right there, verse 6, He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness. The Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And I showed you, John himself, the same writer in verse 19, saw the water and the blood. At least that's how I understand it. He saw the water and the blood come from the side of Jesus. And then he, the Spirit spoke to him and said, the water and the blood is there because he pierced him. Much like in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, that they're going to pierce and they're going to mourn for him that's a son. Well, why did they pierce him? Because they didn't break his legs, just like the Messiah. Uh, it's, it said that the Passover lamb wouldn't have his legs broken. And so when he looks back on the water and the blood and the spirit testifying and bearing record through him, he writes in 1 John chapter 5, it's the spirit and the water and the blood that testify. These three agree in one. And what is the testimony? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, it's very suspect to me that many people, as I said, will have tunnel vision and will will hone in on that specific phrase right there and not look at the whole context. And so I wanted to study it and I wanted to share what the context, not not what other people have said and, and the way that I've looked at it in the past, but really... I want to know what is the truth. I want to know. And so I studied it, and I'm just sharing with you what, what I feel, feel has been revealed to me personally. And so people will read into the context what they want to see many times, and we can be just as guilty of that. Yeah. Um, and so we need uh, the witness, the Spirit of God, to reveal to us what is, what is the truth, because it is the Spirit of truth. So we need that Spirit of truth to rightly interpret and to not have tunnel vision and then to focus and take something out of context, but to understand what really is this author trying to communicate to us. Mm-hmm. And I think in, in my mind, and I think I've shown very clearly in First John chapter 5, the very thing that he's trying to communicate is that the Father sent a Son, mm-hmm. and that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And I, I don't see him trying to prove a trinity or trying to prove three co-eternal persons. He's simply trying to say that this is the Son of God. Thank you for watching this video from Line of Truth Ministries. You can help get this timely and important video out by liking, sharing, 
and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Also, don't forget to check out our website, lineoftruth.org.